Hello. Welcome to Haymarket Live. I'm Malcolm Harris. I'm the author of, as you can see, Palo Alto, A History of California, Capitalism, and the World. Yes, thank you, Tunit, also with the book. Yep. Um, I'm reading it. I'm about to read it, but it's quite uh, substantial. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Right. Um, I'm Timnit uh, Gabru, and I am uh, the founder and executive director of DARE, the Distributed AI Research Institute. And um, yeah, we are an interdisciplinary research institute based out of currently we have people in three continents, U.S., uh, North America, U.S. and Canada. Uh, we don't have anyone in Mexico yet. Um, EU and Africa. So uh, should we get into it? Should we get into this? We are we are already into it. We are live oh, at Haymarket Live. Um, I was really excited to to get to talk to you, Tim Neat, because uh, I feel like we're our works overlap a lot. Uh, where you're dealing very contemporarily with the latest instantiation of Silicon Valley values and what I call the Palo Alto system that goes back over 150 years, and you're dealing with like the exact same stuff I'm talking about throughout this 700 page book, uh, in the present. And it's like the, the ghosts of this past are, are harassing you day by day by day. Um, and so our, our work's really like a, but against right up against each other, the, the implications of the history are, are live, uh, much like ourselves on Haymarket live. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I feel like what I'm trying to do right now is learn the stuff I should have been learning, you know, when I was in school in Palo Alto. Um, I guess Stanford's its own city, or uh, but um, I no, mean, it's not. It's Palo Alto. They, okay. they call it Stanford, California, but it's a lie. Yeah. So basically, this um, I feel like I'm trying to learn uh, the actual history and actual. Uh, what was going on uh, rather than the propaganda that I kind of learned um, doing engineering, electrical engineering at Stanford. And so, you know, I have your book, I have Wendy's Abolish Silicon Valley, you know, I'm trying to just <laughs> educate myself. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm actually wondering if, you know, in your book, you start all the way uh, uh, at 1850. Your sections are basically 50, 50 year periods, I kind of more or less, right? Um, so I'm wondering if you can um, tell us a little bit about, you know, um, yeah, what was going on? Why did you start in, uh, you know, 1850 and what was, what's like the main thread? I know eugenics is a big one. Yeah, well, in eugenics, it's something we get to talk about because I feel like it connects our work and it's totally a, a through line and really is so much of the Palo Alto project. Um, and so people who don't expect to see eugenics as this sort of California project who might think of it as something older, uh, you might be surprised when you open this book. So I start in the in the mid 19th century, both because that's the beginning of Anglo American Alta California history, right? That's the colonization of this territory by Californians who we now understand to be Californians for the first time. Uh, and at the same time, it's the it triggers this period of global capitalism. And so the foundation of this territory that we now, that's become so important to this period of history, also inaugurates that period. And so it's a really useful bookmark uh, for me. <clears throat> and one of the backgrounds to doing this history is uh, a discussion, sort of national discussion about American history that sort of refounds the story of American history in the 1870s and looks at the 1870s at the post-Civil War United States and says, this is really where the country of today starts. And California doesn't really get included in that story as something that also starts in that period. But Palo Alto itself begins in the 1870s. That's when Leland Stanford, you know, takes his his wife and his one son and flees the class conflict of San Francisco, flees the working men's party who are outside his window yelling at him and moves to the suburbs. Uh, but the suburbs don't exist yet in the 1870s. You have to found one. And so he founds one. He calls it Palo Alto. Um, and well, that's I the beginning. I didn't know that. Why does he what? Lela I didn't know that. It was Leland Stanford who? It was Leland Stanford who founds Palo Alto and founds it like literally to escape the class conflicts that he triggers 
Um, and so from the beginning, it's the working men's party yelling at him to fire his Chinese workers. Um, that causes the eruption of Palo Alto. And so Palo Alto is a, is a safety valve for the class conflict of the 1870s. And this is, you know, Paris commune times. This is like, things are really kicking off all in cities all over the world between the working class and the ruling class. And the ruling class figures out this strategy of, look, we got to move to the suburbs. We got to get out of here and move somewhere where we're in charge of everything that goes on for as far as the eye can see. And that, as far as the eye can see, right, that 8,000 acres is what then later becomes Leland Stanford Junior University. Yeah, that's not what we learned uh, in orientation. <laughs> this is not really what. <laughs> but they tell you about the horses, right? Oh, yeah. They, they tell us about, um, I think what I remember is that um, the son died really young um, mm -hmm. and uh, in his honor, that was, you know, when Stanford was built and it's a wonderful story and, you know, they're all angels and that's, that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of what we learn about. Um, and then you also, um, said earlier that the gold rush was another, another, um, big thing that you talked about. And I'm really interested in that because I was recently talking about how there's an AI gold rush right now, a similar kind of dynamic right now. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the gold rush becomes the real model for California capitalism, at least spiritually, into the future. And like you said, into like right now, right? We The gold rush has been used to describe every single commercial innovation, every single cycle um, in Silicon Valley history and even pre-Silicon Valley history, if you go back to like, you know, the agricultural land gold rush or whatever. Uh, and it's because there's just no better uh, speculative metaphor for like, there's money on the ground, everyone come to the money game, you know? It's like yeah. free money for everyone, come here as fast as you can. It doesn't beat that, right? And so when Netscape is taking off as the in the 90s, it looks like a gold rush. It's the same thing. It's money's on the ground for whoever's around here. Um, and yet it was, and they teach, they taught me very young in California schools that it's not about who picks up the gold on the ground. It's who's able to start some kind of business, you know, yeah. with that gold, who's able to, to speculate on something uh, uh, from that position. And so the person who starts Palo Alto, Leland Stanford, is not a gold miner per se. He's a grocer, right? His brothers are grocers and they they start a hardware store, SAS Grocery, as are the other associates, the capitalists who join Leland Stanford to build the railroad eventually. They're these petty, you know, grocers, basically. They, they're a business who sell to these, uh, the gold miners. Yeah. Um, and that's the, he's always making money, not in the the way that you'd think you would be making money, but in the, the other way. So even when the railroad hits big, it's not off the railroad that he's making money. It's off the real, the land development company that's speculating on land prices near the railroad. It's off the rail company that's contracting rails to the railroad, which they also own because it's smart to own your subcontractor. And so these financial strategies from the beginning that build the the California capitalist class uh, into something that matters are ones that you see totally into the present. And Leland Stanford is really um, one model for the California capitalist that I think is great, partly because everyone's making fun of him the whole time, even that like even his co-capitalists are like, this guy's a goofball. You know, he doesn't know how to make any money. Money just gets made for him. Like, we're doing all the work. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't know what he's doing. He just wants to go play with his horses. Because that was sort of the only thing he was interested in was horses. Um, That's <clears throat> just so interesting how it's like the same story and a, a different characters. You know, same movie, like we're on season 10 or something. You know, same show. Because it, what you were saying about uh, about, like... That's exactly what I was trying to say when the, when I wanted to say that there was the there's like an AI gold rush right now in the sense that you know not everybody's necessarily making money in the way that you expect them to but like everybody's mm -hmm. cashing in and I'm like sometimes I'm like man like if I were only able to cash in you know like I know the ways in which you know there's like oh, the yeah. numerism like give me money to stop the existential risk uh -huh. and there's like the oh utopia it's gonna solve everything 
and then there's, I don't know, like there's all of these adjacent like things that are happening where they're cashing in uh, from from this gold rush or like there is the press, right? Like the the the, the media frenzy and um it's, or it's, selling it's really, selling shovels is what they called it, you know, back because it was the it's you don't make money from the gold mining because very quickly that becomes pretty difficult. But if you've got the the shovel selling monopoly and you're selling shovels at really high prices to everyone, and I look at like the metaverse, right? Like very recently, you know, opened and closed since I wrote this book. Uh, but it's like, who made money off the metaverse? It's like, well, the consultants, the guy, some guy who wrote a metaverse bestseller who made money off the metaverse, right? And yeah. I look at like AI, so called or whatever, the large language module yeah. model uh, software uh, boom. And it's the same thing where it's guys being like, let me let me sell you on seven ways to make money using chat GPT. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's the same thing. It's like, well, the only people who are making money here are the ones who are selling us like shovels that we can go mine with. No one seems to be finding any gold or whatever, except yeah. for the speculate speculative bets on some of these big companies. Um, some of you know, so what I find um uh, interesting is um, the whole eugenics um, th that eugenics uh, so many so few people like even when I started talking about eugenics um, I got I, like very much attacked because people basically just think eugenics equals Nazis um, but for you know you um, write about eugenics in your book and you also you know and many of us know that it you know California was a hub um, of this ideology. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I want to address the Nazi connection uh, like early because sort of California and California eugenicists rivalry with German Germany and German eugenicists is very interesting because they're building at the same period, right? The 1870s, the same time that California is rising to its like early power. Germany is distinguishing itself as a state for the first time. So the same forces that are pulling California together and into world capitalism are, are pulling the German provinces into a state as well. Um, and so you see the, the rise of science and technology in both places, and they're drawing from each other. So Leland Stanford, before their Stanford University, the first thing in Palo Alto um, is the Palo Alto stock farm. And it's the largest trotting horse breeding and training facility in the world. And he says, I'm going to reinvent the production of horses. He says there are 13 million horses are engines of the country at this point. They drag, uh, you know, canals are horse operated. Streetcars are horse operated. Agriculture street is uh, horse operated. Uh, the military machinery is horse operated. They got to drag, you know, all your provisions and cannons and stuff. There are 13 million horses in the country. California farms in particular, because they're technologically advanced, are particularly horse intensive at the end of the 19th century, that they use three times as many horses as the average American farm. And Leland Stanford says, I'm going to reinvent horses and I'm going to disrupt horses. Even though this is an ancient technology, horse carriages, I'm, I'm Leland Stanford. I'm a, you know technologist, I'm a capitalist, I have new powers, I can scale in ways that no one else has been able to scale. And if I'm going to raise the, the value of every American horse by $100, which is worth 1.3 billion, if you multiply it all out, $1.3 billion. And it's like perfect disruptor math. Um, and so he does, and he builds um, the largest uh, horse training facility in the world. And he's also going to change his method and he's going to create this new method that he calls the Palo Alto system with his head trainer, this guy named Charles Marvin. What's and the to, Palo Alto system? So that this is the, what they invent to, to reinvent, uh, the trotting horse, which are the horses that are pulling things. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, people might be familiar with this, these efforts. It's through the works of Edward Moybridge who invents moving pictures just as like an auxiliary side effort, just part of this uh, attempts, right? It also invents motion pictures. Uh, so it's like a real, a real scientific effort here and real commercial effort. Um, but so they decide that they're going to shorten the length of horse production that 
course raising wisdom till this point has held that you don't race horses as fast as you possibly can till they're a couple years old because the risk is too great that you're going to spoil the horse, that you're going to break a leg or snap a ligament or something, and it's not worth it. And Leland Stanford says, well, I can scale it no, the way no one else can. I can afford to waste a bunch of horses. And in, and in that process, we're going to find out who the, the fastest ones are when they're one year old, when they're infants. We're going to raise the fastest, youngest horses, and then we're going to invest in those ones. And then we'll be able to have their genetic material uh, extracted faster. And so we'll be able to f profit faster. And to this end, he looks to Germany where Germany has created this new institution for early childhood education, because they say that childhood education is very important to the creation of this new state, and so we need to create institutions for state education of young children. And this institution is called the kindergarten. And there is, there is no kindergarten in America west of the Rockies at this point. They didn't have them for kids. But yeah. Leland Stanford says, I'm going to build a kindergarten for horses. So he builds a shrunk-down track um, where they can race yearlings as fast as they can. And this is a successful effort. They r end up raising the youngest, fastest horses in the world uh, with the Palo Alto system. Now, this ultimately does, is not as useful as like he projected it would be because steam power and then mm -hmm. gas power uh, overtake the horse. Uh, but the Palo Alto system, and people like in Palo Alto, don't know what the Palo Alto system is, right? Like you never heard you're as tech as they get, right? You never heard that term. Even yeah. though it's such a it's such a great metaphor and such a great like I, I mean, example. Yeah. Like all of the things you said are like, yeah, this is Silicon Valley. I'm going to disrupt and scale. I can afford to lose a few, you know. <laughs> right. And like youth, you know, we got to invest in youth and the assumption yeah. that the the traits displayed by the infant are the same traits that'll be displayed by the adult. And so that like, and they say, you know, in their writings about this system that you can you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, whether this horse can handle the speed or not, because if their leg breaks, well, that's just, they could never have handled it anyway. And so you're just getting early information and early information is always valuable. And so if you, it's better to break a horse younger than to wait to find out that until the, they're five years old and they're not the fastest, then who cares? You know, then you wasted four years of resources that could have been put on a faster horse that like yeah. you could have found out when they were infants. And then I look at someone like Sam Altman or even someone like Elizabeth Holmes who like understand that and they understand what people are looking for and what the market's looking for. And they understand the Palo Alto system at a real like bone level. And they say like, I'm worth more if I drop out as a freshman, like I'm worth more if I drop out now because I'm younger. Uh, and they understand that like people see them that way and that they're still enacting these like this Palo Alto system. Um, and that was just like the first eugenic step of Palo Alto, right? Like that's just one. You know, um, I, th the way I started, well, I, I, the way I started looking into this, and it's not even my area really, you know, I, I'm supposed to be a technologist and I'm supposed to be an engineer and a scientist and building things, but um, there's so many messed up things that are going on. I wanted to understand um, what what was driving the current AGI mania, right? Uh, artificial general intelligence mania. Like, where did this come from? What, uh, you know, why is, because when I was working and when I was studying in the space, like 10 years ago even, it wasn't this mainstream thing. Like, so, you know, mm -hmm. OpenAI and Friends and DeepMind and all of them, their mission literally says they want to build AGI, right? But that wasn't like the mainstream thing in, in quote unquote AI. Like that wasn't um, people people's goals weren't like, you know, to build AGI. And, um, and then, you know, the whole, you know, warning. And so it was like weird because at the same time, they're like, oh my God, we, we have to build AGI. That's the goal. It's going to bring utopia for everybody. It's going to like solve all your problems. I mean, the way they talk about it when you see them, it's like, oh my God, it's going to be a benevolent God. You don't even know how amazing it's going to be. And, you know, human flourishing, whatever. 
And then on the flip side, they're like, oh my God, it's so existentially dangerous. You yeah, know? And it's going to yeah. murder us all. It's going to <laughs> torture it's us like, all. Okay, death. which one is it? And so, and like every day now, there's this, I'm, we're like bombarded. I was telling my team, it feels like a DDoS attack with, by one of these institutes. Like just today, there is yet another. Um, you know, now it's not even a letter. It's like a, a, a sentence that people are signing on about the existential risks of AI. And, and now it's become super mainstream. So, you know, 10 years ago or something, when Elon Musk would say that we're summoning the devil with AI or whatever, people were making fun of him, you know? And now mm -hmm. all those people are just joining in. I mean, it's like a few. We can still like make fun of them. I'm still making, I'm still making fun of them. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, me, me too, but it, it really feels like the gold rush. Even that part of the marketing for me, it really does feel like the gold rush. So like I was, you know, I was trying to figure out like, where is this coming from? And I saw Emil uh, P. Torres, who was a former long-termist, um, kind of writing about long-termism and stuff. And, and you know, and I was around these people for a while, like when I was um, in, in Silicon Valley or when I was, you know, a grad student and stuff. I remember I met these effective altruists and they had um, a conference on effective altruism. And I'm like, what's effective altruism? Where, well, it's, it's about doing the most good, you know, more efficiently and, you know, the, you know, figuring out how you can do it with limited resources and maximizing utility and stuff. I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, who is your speaker? Their main speaker was Peter Thiel. And he was talking about how, if you want to do the most good ever, um, you got to work on AI. And I'm like, why? How did you come to that conclusion? And they're like, well, you know, they, even if there's a 0 0.00 whatever percent chance of AI um, destroying humanity, uh, and um, it's going to happen one million thousand years from now. So it's most important for all of us to make sure that we stop doing that. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm just going to get away from you guys. Right. But now I can't do that because it's like <laughs> because they're it's everywhere. Me. They're everywhere. And I'm like, I'm, I feel like I'm living in a different planet or something like that because it's just so strange. And so I was trying to figure out like, why did this happen? How did this happen? So um, I was like reading uh, up on this stuff, like all the, this, you know, these people prophesizing, for instance, about the singularity. I don't know if you've heard about mm -hmm. the singularity, you know, how, how, oh my God, the singularity is coming and it's going to be in five years. It's going to be in 10 years. Or like they, they change their calculations every so often. And once the singularity happens, man and machine merge and it's all going to be amazing. And we're not even, go we can't even know how great it's going to be. It's like the same language that Sam Altman makes, uh, taught, has. And so I kind of had a hunch in that I was seeing this, a similar language, um, you know, with people I was, you know, around like 10 years ago, I was trying to get mm -hmm. away from them. Then I was seeing Emil's writings. It was like similar language, but I didn't even know, like, I remember Bostrom's book and all that, but I don't, I didn't remember there was a thing called long-termism. I knew about the effect of altruism, but I didn't know that term. And then we start looking into it. It's like, you know, the people who wrote the first book about AGI are like, are calling it transhuman AGI. You know, they want to, they say they want to, you know, they want to, they want to create basically like, a, like a matrix is the only way I can describe it, where people upload their minds and colonize the cosmos. And they, they call it paradise engineering, you know? And like, they think that this is how we're gonna fulfill our human destiny. And like, we look into it and we see that the first, you know, that one of the first transhumanists was um, the president of the British Eugenics Society. And actually talking about in these terms, like there's some collective destiny that humanity is supposed to reach. And now it's not even just like, you know, reaching that destiny that humanity is supposed to reach, but transcending all of the issues, the, you know, of humanity. Like mm -hmm. you're not frail anymore and all of that. And I'm just like, how can people not see the eugenics connections, right? And so the first the first attacks we got was because you know people think okay eugenics equals nazis right they're not associating it with scientists leland stanford right or silicon valley um and and so like trying to make these connections because you know what i was trying to say to even to engineers was like if you know this um connection and you know how it, it came about you probably 
this is probably not your goal. Like many, many engineers, you know, there's the top echelons and then there's, a, you know, there's a whole bunch of, you know, foot soldiers and there's like a whole pyramid, right? And so I'm like, I bet, you know, I've gone to school, I've, I've worked with some of you, like I bet, you, you know, this is not what you wanna advocate for, right? But it's it's still like a really difficult case to make because there, you know, the the histories you're talking about with respect to uh, to California, the sterilization, um, you know, and mm -hmm. all of that, and um, and and Shockley, you know, and how he wrote so many eugenics <laughs> texts, and the first Stanford uh, president, uh, Jordan, being a eugenicist. I didn't even know that until I read about the um, Stanford Eugenics Project. And, you know, and, and it's like not seen as a progressive scientific movement, which is what it mm -hmm. was, right? And so we still just get so many attacks for connecting any of these things to eugenics. Well, that's why I think the, the setting up the, the historical relationship between <clears throat> the Americans and the Californians in particular and the Germans is, is really worthwhile because it continues into the David Starr Jordan era because when they start the university, their first president is this guy, David Starr Jordan, who comes out of Indiana University. You know, they're basically starting like Elon Musk University in the middle of nowhere in California. And they're like, hey, president of Harvard, like, do you want to come be president of Stanford? We'll triple your salary. And they're like, no, fuck off. Like, so none of the Ivy, none of the Ivy League presidents like want to go be president of Stanford University in the middle of yeah. nowhere yeah. in its first year or whatever. So they get they go down the list sort of till they get to this guy, David Starr Jordan at Indiana University. And he's very progressive minded, just as they are, which means he believes in uh, co-ed education, which is a big, you know, the like, yeah. The Ivies don't gender integrate fully till like the 80s, you know, like this is a that's still a very like advanced that, in that private higher ed. Learned about in um, orientation. That yeah, was, right. I bet they tell you about that part. Propaganda. They're very proud. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. They don't tell you why and what they were interested in. That it's a like eugenic project with by uh, admitting women like intentionally to breed. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Can, oh, you, yeah. can you elaborate? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So one way I talk about in the book is that they're they're asking people for their heights consistently uh, and that they as a result, you go back through the archives and they have this continual problem with not having enough long beds. And so these articles in the Stanford Daily from like 1930, from 1950, being like, we don't have enough seven foot beds. You know, the average height of an American male is five foot eight, but we don't have enough seven foot beds. And it's because they associated height with eugenic fitness. And so you go back through the history of Silicon Valley, and it's surprising how many of these people are extraordinarily tall. So David Packard is six foot five. And David Packard is a six foot five, like football playing, basketball playing, like athlete. And that's how he gets picked to lead Hewlett Packard. But it's not, not like part of your application. Like you have to oh, write. Yeah. Down oh, like yeah. Into the, into the 80s. Into, into like, the 80s? Into 1980s, and I believe as well. Wow, as like, that like, is. 80s or 70s. Um, yeah. But now, the, and, and still, if you walk around Stanford campus and I have people tell me, it's like the number of people, especially now women who are six foot tall or taller because the amount of athletes, the amount of, you know, that they yeah. have, have these yeah. practices. Wow. Um, but so but how did they, what, so you were telling the story of when they um, asked Jordan um to yeah, it's, it's hard because there are just so many, oh my God, so many tangents. Like, <laughs> so many things so, to talk so, about. Like, the DNA yeah. of the institution. Um, but so he creates, he, uh, there's a little bit of true crime uh, history in the book where David Starr Jordan finds a way to take over the school from Jane Lathrop Stanford, who's the, the Stanford widow. And it's now commonly accepted that she was murdered uh, poisoned to death. And as a result of that poisoning, whether he was involved or not, David Starr Jordan takes over the university um, and he really builds this eugenicist uh, institution that's really, really devoted to producing engineers as part of that eugenic effort. And so one of the things that happens is one of the guys he recruits, one another one of the uh, professors that he recruits is this guy, Vernon Kellogg. Um, and <clears throat> Vernon Kellogg uh, is part of his association with a member of the first Stanford class, which is an en who is an engineer named Herbert Hoover, uh, ends up going to Germany in before the United States joins World War One and being a liaison to the German high command. 
And Vernon Kellogg is this eugenicist. He's a, they go by the the term bionomics. They're teaching this new subject called bionomics, which is mm-hmm. basically um, like evolutionary psychology back in the day. They were like, not only can we explain biology, but we can explain culture, we can explain society, we can explain labor, we can explain section everything. Two, section two of your book. Bionomics. Part uh, of section two, yeah. And so they they think they can explain everything that way. So Vernon Kellogg is very excited to go talk to these Germans and talk about bionomic theory and evolutionary theory with these Germans, yeah. part of the German high command before the United States enters World War One. And he writes this long article for the Atlantic about his experiences that gets turned into a book um, called Headquarters Nights, I believe is the title. Um, and his conclusion is like, yo, these guys are crazy. Like they think they're going to conquer the world that like we, that, that the, the Jordan idea of eugenics was anti-imperialist because war was dysgenic. Mm. You know, the bravest young men now we're just going to get shot. They're the first out of the trench just means the first shot. We have to avoid wars because wars are dysgenic Mm. and we have to, we don't want imperialism because I'm too racist to be an imperialist. We don't want the Philippines. We don't want those people in our polity, you know? Yeah. Uh, but so Kellogg comes back from Germany and says, like, you know, that whole no war thing, the like peaceful development, it's not going to work because the Germans are going to fight and like they're going to try and kill us. Mm-hmm. And so unless we have some eugenic strategy to fight wars using our best and brightest to win wars without risking their lives, mm-hmm. uh, we're what screwed. Like We need to figure this out. Um, so we need, and the Germans who have been working on education as part of a state power, um, have already incorporated science and technology development into their war machine. Yeah. And so Palo Alto says, we have to come up with an answer to this. We have to be able to fight this war and we have to preserve our genes. So another guy that came over from Indiana university is a guy named Lewis Terman. And he's another Start eugenicist. Building. That's uh, that's um, de- uh, what is it called? Um, demolished now. But I ha- I spent some days in that building, and it was definitely not friendly to women. Like um, there was like one bathroom, um, and it was just like you know. But the only thing I learned about Terman when I was at Stanford was that he lent money to Hewitt and Packard to start their thing. We didn't he hear did. this. <laughs> yeah. Well, and he so he was yeah he was a. He's most famous for adapting the IQ test, which was this test in um, in France that was used for something different. It was basically for like identifying students who needed extra help at school, or whatever. And he was like the Stanford, the, the French guy who invented it named Binet said like, don't use this as a test for general IQ. And yeah. Terman says, great, we're going to adapt it for general IQ. I think that was Terman who did that. And so that was Terman, and it becomes the Stanford oh Binet IQ test, which yeah. becomes the like. And they need this tool to do eugenics for humans, right? To do bionomics for humans. They needed yeah. some test that pulled out this generalized IQ variable that they just made up that has no scientific basis. And people said didn't have any scientific basis at the time, but it was really useful for a couple different things. So one of the things, one of the first uses that they did was applying it to uh, World War I draftees. And they would give them the test. Um, it was called Army Alpha and Army e Beta at the time. And the idea was you take the A students, and it was. It was split up into five, uh, you know, parts, quintiles, just like we have grades now. The two were connected. And you move the A students away from the front so that they don't get shot. You move them to the ROTC or whatever. You make sure that they're not on the front lines. You make sure the C students are on the front lines. And like the F students, you probably don't want them on the front lines because like they're probably not your best soldiers. Mm. Uh, And so that was this use of this IQ test. And it didn't really click all click into place for me until I found out that Lewis Terman's son, Frederick Terman, who you probably heard about as a Stanford student, becomes he becomes very important to the university, turned 18 just after they lowered the draft age to 18. And so this idea of like your genes were at stake, uh, you know, overseas in the trenches was very personal for Lewis Terman and for the Stanford Genesis that they had like their children were on campus and he stayed on campus throughout the war and then goes on to be very, very, very important in winning World War II. Um, and so he's a subject of what they called the the California genius tests, 
where term led by Terman, the Terman genius tests, where they tried to identify every genius, school age genius in the state of California with the idea that these were kids that you had to support just like the, you know, the horses or whatever, and that you, that these would be the future assets of the country, that they would uh, be the science technologists who would be able to win wars for the United States into the future. And one of the people that they tested was Frederick Terman, obviously, Lewis Terman's son, no surprise, genius, uh, you know, which he would have to be because they thought it was an uncomplicatedly genetic variable, right? So if Lewis Terman's a genius, then Frederick Terman's definitely going to be a genius. Lo and behold, he was. Uh, but another, one of the kids they tested was the the only son of two Stanford uh, mining engineers. One of them had been educated there, his mom. And then his dad was a, a professor of mining engineering at the school. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was named William Shockley Jr. And he'd grown up in, in Stanford and they tested him as a small child. And he actually scored just under the the genius level. Um, and that was like a chip he held on his shoulder for his entire life. But so because Shockley he was genius. Because <laughs> he was just he was just on and so his mom tested like 160s. May Bradford Shockley, who was mm. a like mining and one of the first female mining engineers in the West, was apparently like off the charts brilliant. Um and like yeah, so it's this, but so Shockley, who then bring famously brings the silicon to Silicon Valley, you know, That's invents the point contact it. transistor, et cetera. And before that plays a very important role, in fact, just as important a role as Frederick Terman in winning World War II by using his engineering skills, um, is one of these assets who's identified as part of this eugenic study of California youth at the beginning of the 20th century. And so you don't have to like, there's no jumps, right, between that history. I mean, There's and no straight, jump. It's like a couple generations. It's a straight line, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, and, and it's really interesting because it's like such an intentional obfuscation of this history because, you know, I definitely learned about all of these men, right? Mm-hmm. And um, But there were very specific, you know, facts about them that were just thrown at me, like Shockley, you know, uh, being, you know, I did device physics, so um, in electrical engineering, and so definitely we had to learn about like the transistor and how it was built and all of that. Not a single mention. I've never heard the word eugenics the whole time I was at Stanford, you know, undergrad, graduate school, whatever. Um, and then I also, the other really interesting thing is that two obfuscations, right? One is that Stanford was basically a, a eugenics project, a eugenic project. Mm-hmm. But then the second one, uh, of the fact that the whole of Silicon Valley was, I'm mean, actually, I, this came up in our uh, conversation earlier, so it would be interesting to hear your perspective, is, you know, the whole, like, pull pull up your, whatever, your bootstraps kind of thing, where, like, oh, we're so smart, like, we created this whole thing by ourselves, and it's our ingenuity that's making us rich, where it's like, no, you got a lot of money from, from the government, Um these war efforts and um so you were you were explaining earlier that um you um disagree with the you know people saying you know it's like the california ideology that um brought about like the personal comp- computing revolution and all of that um and um can, can you um can you explain a little bit um why that is and and what actually happened yeah my my anti-californian ideology <laughs> yeah. um and it's very it's What's actually very interesting for me as a Marxist who, like, the German ideology is a very important book for me, uh, which is Marx's critique of, like, idealism as a philosophy. And then the Californian ideology, which kind of, like, takes that title or whatever, is very, very idealistic in the way that Marx critiques because it's very like, oh, these guys had these ideas and then those ideas is what produced, uh, you know, the kind of computer world that we had. Mm-hmm. And this this history kind of comes in two flavors, where it's the the hippies invented the computer and the internet, and that's good, and the hippies invented the computer and the internet, and that's bad. Um, and the bad version is that's the sort of Californian ideology version you might hear from, like Adam Curtis, or like it's almost like conventional wisdom, I think, in some parts of the left, that this is what happened and that there were sort of that the hippies turned into the individualists who created the computer, the personal computer industry as we know it today, um, and that they might have had, like, 
hippie or new left beliefs back in the day, but that they, without sort of noticing, betrayed those intentions or beliefs. Uh, and then there's the sort of the capitalist booster one, which is the kind of official version, It's a, which is like, we all loved togetherness and the Grateful Dead, and we like took some acid, and that showed us that how everything is really connected. Mm -hmm. And so then we created the internet and got super rich because we were right, but also chill. Yeah. Um, the version that I learn about at Stanford usually. Yeah, well, and it really is the official history of the Bay. Mm -hmm. Is that like we we were so chill that we invented the history, the future, and got super filthy rich. Mm -hmm. um, and my argument in the book is that n neither of those is what's hap happened, period. Um, and that the conflation that happens, and it's done explicitly in the the essay about the Californian ideology that lays out this this I belief, is the conflation of the new left and the counterculture um, into one thing. Mm -hmm. But as I talk about in the book, the new left, and then the association with those things as pro-technology, is that there was like new left counterculture, anti-war, you know, Grateful Dead milieu that loved personal computers and then just like kept playing with toys till they invented Silicon Valley as we know it today. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's not true. That's not what happened. Like, period. And like the most important thing going on in the world at the time was not the Grateful Dead. It was uh, the Cold War. It was Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so the new left at Stanford in the Bay Area was not pro-technology. In fact, they were trying to blow up literally every computer lab in the country. And they made a, a significant effort to sabotage and destroy every computer in the country because they understood that those computers were tools of war, that the Vietnam War was being fought on their campus with these computers. Um, and they bombed them. They bombed, they bombed the hell out of Stanford campus for years. Wow. Um, yeah, which is crazy, right? <clears throat> So like they bombed Slack, like Slack was bombed. The like center for advanced uh, behavioral studies um, where John Rawls was finishing uh, a theory of justice mm -hmm. was, fi was firebombed and his draft of a theory of justice was almost destroyed. He was woken up in the middle of the night by a call saying like, and apparently his wife said that he answered the call and looked to her and said, I can't write it again. <laughs> that then, like they were lucky that that wasn't destroyed by the sprinkler or whatever. Yeah. But, like the, we were this close to never having to read a theory of justice thanks to the militants of uh, of Stanford University. Um, and so this idea that like that these are the people who they love technology and and were confused about what was going to happen in the future and let their idealism pull them down this wrong path is wrong. They thought they were very aware of what was at stake. Mm -hmm. um, right. And when they they occupied the applied electronics lab um, at Stanford famously, this was like a major moment and was considered a major moment by the left and by the international left as a like moment of solidarity uh, with Vietnam. And so like Bobby Seale, uh, the co-founder of the Black Panthers, comes to this occupation and gives it the endorsement of the Black Panthers. Like Tom Hayden, who's on trial with Bobby Seale uh, after the 68 convention, comes and endorses this occupation. And in fact, after that occupation, um, and uh, something I argue in the, in the book, is that the Panthers take inspiration from this action and add popular control over modern technology to the 10-point plan in the second draft after the experience of this occupation. And so like these were people who were very, very aware about like the social determinants of technology and they were knew exactly what this tech was being used for and yeah. how they were going to act in relation to it. And that's a story that gets totally papered over that like yeah. no one wants to talk about any of that part. And no. when you read about them in the official history, if it comes up at all, they're sort of uh, talked about as clowns, as like ridiculous. They they didn't know what they were doing, didn't know what was going on because they weren't like themselves computer people. And that was, which is not true. Some of them were. It's like um, Cynthia um, Coley, who just got out of jail, was a like computer prodigy. It was a teenage computer prodigy. Um, yeah, it's it's the same. Like I said earlier, it's like the same movie playing again, you know. And uh, uh, and it's like we don't get to watch part one and two, and part three is like the same with different characters, you know. But like, because that's the exact same kind of critique of people right now. Well, it's it's really interesting when you're talking about bombing. Um, 
because uh, there is a, a strand of the eugenicists right now, right? Um, and like Emil and I have dubbed them the test grill bundle. Um, and uh, um, you, I, I believe you talk about Miri and Yudovsky and stuff in your book too. And like, he is talking about bombing data centers, but a, for a completely different reason, so that like we don't create this, you know, apparently, you know, he's so worried about creating some uh, super intelligent god, devil, I don't know, thing. Yeah, it would um, be a real shame if we created a real super powerful thing that would like discipline know, me. <laughs> it's like they they it, sound like so like so BDSM. China's going to do it if we don't do it. So you also can't regulate us. But you need to think about regulating that 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 God that might be created and is going to be created. We all have to think about that. But also, you, you, you can't regulate us because we're creating the good kind and China's doing the bad kind. So, you know, and so what's super interesting for me is that this dude... Um, like has never had any training AI or anything like that, whether it's mm -hmm. analyzing the social impacts or doing anything. And she was just recently talking about something that made it super obvious. He has no idea what he's talking about. Right. And like, it amazes me how he got here. I just like that, that I have to say that is a skill. Like, how did you scam yeah. your way to the top and create a, an institute, Miri machine intelligence research Institute, right? and get op-eds on time and stuff i just wrote a whole word back to ted <laughs> the ted people uh, who asked me if i would be interested in participating in something or another i'm like let me tell you um you know i had a whole thing to them because i'm like how how you know and he also has very openly worried about dysgenic pressures and um, amusing about, oh, the IQ test seemed to be dropping in like some European mm -hmm. country. Oh, I, but I don't think it's because it, it doesn't seem to be because of immigration. Or someone on, on Twitter asks him like, you know, how old, uh, at what, at which age do you think a child has a right to life? And he's like, I don't know, but I'm not an expert in this whatever area, but maybe between one and four, you know, like they are such openly eugenicist people um, with this project. And, and yet just like calling it that it seem it, it still seems to be like, uh, you know, th they get to kind of attack us for it, which is so unbelievable to me. It really goes back to <clears throat> like this whole Palo Alto mission, which is how do you solve this problem? You know, when they square off against the Germans and they say, how are we going to save ourselves into the future? You know, how are we going to extend this elite project that we recognize, you know, and how do we like maintain our position of inequality in an equalizing world? Right. If, and do you look at the beginning of the 20th century that the world seems to be on a long term path towards the equalization of all people, right? Like how do you arrest that process? How do you keep more power in smaller hands? And that's what the like, the Palo Alto engineer is created to do from yeah. the beginning, which, where it's a tool of colonization, um, where everywhere that they're tearing up the world at the end of the 19th century, which really creates the world that we have today, whether it's the division of Africa or the, the colonization yeah. of South America, really happens with this rush at the end of the 19th century, you know, the colonization of, of China. Um, and California engineers were the foot soldiers, you know, not not the foot soldiers, but the real heralds, right? They were the ones who were directing the mechanics of this um, with the the skills they learned in California. And it's only one, literally one generation from William Shockley Sr., who is doing that work, to William Shockley Jr., who before the point contact resistor, before the, you know, uh, Silicon Valley and all that, he's working for the Defense Department and he's writing a, a paper called On the Economics of Atomic Bombing. And he's saying, measuring everything in terms of man months, and, you know, how much for a bomb, how many man months does it take us to build and how many man months on the other side does it destroy? Yeah. yeah. And that like strategic bombing is, is, a, is an advancement in the amount of uh, efficiency that you get from killing, but that atomic bombing is such a giant step in lethal efficiency that they're so it's not even that they're so destructive it's that they're so cheap 
um, that it costs so few man months to, and he's not officially even read in on the atomic on the, like Los Alamos project. He just like knows what's going on when he's writing this. And so he writes this, this paper about like, what are the post-war implications of the existence of atomic bombs and the ability to do so much damage so cheaply. And he says, uh, you know, he basically writes out the mutually assured destruction plan that we're going to have, you know, bombs throughout the world and all these different places pointed in all these different directions. And he sort of muses that like, well, we're really headed towards the situation where one man could destroy the whole world. And that this is sort of where his brain goes, that it's like, well, if you jump, jump from like 10 to 100 or 1 to 100, then the jump to 100 to 10,000 is no bigger, right? Then like the you, you could just go very quickly to one person destroying the world. Interesting. And when the, when the head of the Air Force adapts this essay into like an official position paper that becomes the U.S. post-war, you know, economic global order – that needs semiconductors that will William Shockley Jr. is in a perfect position to create. Um, he takes out that sentence about one man destroying the world and like cuts that little sort of like psycho bit because Bill Shockley Jr. is a fucking psycho and everyone who meets him knows he's a psycho. He can't run a company for five minutes before everyone leaves. He's obsessed with IQs and competition. He's always making people comp compete uh, within each other. And so basically his business career flops, even though he's a brilliant technologist. And where does he land? He, well, he gets a seat at Stanford yeah. University. He gets a, a, an endowed chair um, that's actually set up by the Ampex Corporation, which is founded by a uh, refugee from the Russian Revolution who is part of the White Russian Army who starts Ampex. But that's a, a longer story. Um, but so it's, the money comes from the same, you know, anti-colonial uh, – conflict or whatever um endows this chair for shockley and in this chair instead of doing you know semiconductor engineering or whatever he's supposed to be physics whatever he's supposed to be doing in this chair starts turning stanford into one of the world centers for contemporary nazi thought and I mean, there's no there's the, about eugenics i mean even in the i feel like well the 70s stuff i was seeing oh yeah you know, it was just so amazing. Like, and, and and I'm telling you, not a single mention of this anywhere at Stanford. Well, and it's 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 very very influential because he ends up working with this guy named Jensen, um, who gets influenced. Basically, Shockley convinces him. You know, he's this Nobel Prize winning physicist yeah. who wants yeah. sits down this education scholar and says, "Listen, IQ is real." And it's racially linked and compensatory education doesn't work. You're never going to be able to teach black kids to be as smart as white kids. It's just is impossible. And he's a scientist and I'm a Nobel Prize winning scientist and I'm telling you this. And he convinces them. And Jensen ends up being one of the most important, uh, you know, most influential racists in the 20th century. Uh, you know, and that's um, because he has that chair just very directly. Just recently – there was this paper manuscript from Microsoft Research, um, and um, they had, I, I haven't read the whole paper, I'm not going to do it. Um, they um, claimed that GPT-4, whatever, maybe it's GPT-3, I don't even know, Does the, 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 GP, the, the OpenAI's um, chatbot has sparks, quote unquote, sparks of AGI. Uh, you know, uh, uh, artificial general intelligence. I'm, I'm not even going to deal with this. So Emily M. Bender starts mm -hmm. going through the paper and her mantra is always, always look at the footnotes. You know, she's like, always look at right. the footnotes, always look at the citations. So um, the, f the first or second citation they have in the paper, in the intro is, and this is a thing they put on archive. It's not peer reviewed is um, a, an editor, a, a link to a, an editorial of a bunch of um, people defending Charles Murray in 19, mm -hmm. uh, after his book, you know, and um, because there was an outcry and they write this editorial defending him. Um, and that is, this is like a few weeks ago, you know what I'm saying? And so here is this paper talking about you know, artificial general intelligence, whatever, and their second citation is to this thing. And I think they changed it now after she um, she brought it up, but it just tells you that 
I'm not, you know, when I say, when I talk about eugenics and AI, I'm not even talking about them, right? The ones who are like just citing whatever. And, and you'll say, you can say maybe they didn't, you know, read it and didn't know. I'm talking about the Yudovskis. I'm talking about the Bostroms, talking about dysgenic, you know, pressures as an existential risk of like, you know, stupid people reproducing as an existential mm -hmm. risk and stuff. And, and then they'll be like, Oh no, but I was just in the same, you know, I just worked with him. I just cited him. It's not like I'm, I'm not a eugenicist. I don't have a sign that says I'm a, you know, eugenicist. I'm like, well, you're, you're saying all the things you're doing, all the things you're advocating for all the things. And it's like, even if you weren't explicitly advocating for it, which you are, the undercurrent is that, you know, it, as, as your book shows, even as, as this conversation shows, even if we were not talking about the explicitly Genesis people, which there are, even if you don't address that, the undercurrent is that, basically. That is what Stanford was built on. That's what Palo Alto was built on. That's what Silicon Valley was built on. Well, and even just like the figure of the Stanford engineer, no offense, uh, was created with the idea that we need to create people who can keep the, the rest of the world at bay. Right. People who can exercise an amount of power um, that reflects their intelligence and their skills vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world and are able to dominate them with it. Um, and that this is a part and a crucial part of the American project. And so when people say that, like, oh, Silicon Valley is just a bunch of like hype or just a bunch of fluff or it's all Theranos or like there's nothing really there. Mm -hmm. um, I th there's an element of that like it's true and I do think that like open AI is fake and I think that like Sam Altman has that grin on his face 24 7 because like if he stops like you're gonna see the fear in his eyes that like he yeah. has promised the world that he can spin straw into gold and like he absolutely but knows I that he cannot knows how to do so that often. I honestly I think the AI cycle goes and you know there's oh, yeah. winters and stuff and so like they do this and then people forget <clears> and then they do it again and then yeah they well and cybernetics is is like you know th this has been going on for almost a century now the idea that like oh we're just around the corner they're going to mm -hmm. automate everything or whatever um so there is like that is true and i don't want to um say that that's not the case and like elon musk is a clown show like whatever um but there is a real project here and that's where i talk about teal in the book and that's where i talk about shockley and that like the first generation of silicon chips all went into the minuteman one nuclear missiles and like that was a real project right that was a gun aimed at the world's head saying if anything happens to america everyone dies and like that's a real thing that's a, a success of the palo alto system um yeah. and that project continues into you know so I write about the Iran-Contra scandal and the shadow government that's being run out of the White House in the 80s um, being run on laptops that were created by a spinoff from the Palo Alto Research Center from Xerox Park, mm -hmm. um, And that we don't talk about that as part of the legacy of Xerox Park is like the Reagan administration and Iran-Contra and the, like turning the world into a series of massacre sites, right? Um, and then even in that, even in the Iran Contra story, we don't talk about Angola and we don't talk about Afghanistan and we don't talk about a lot of like the actual Cold War history that's yeah. part of this and the role of company called, you know, the front company for Iran Contra, the whole thing was a company called Stanford Technology Corp. And it was led by a guy who was a sales agent for Hewlett Packard, <laughs> you know, and it's like the, this is Palo Alto history. This is this, yeah. this is the, what this place is for. And people don't like telling that version of what this place is for. Um, but it has a real project. There is something substantial here. And so when I look at now, uh, you know, when I look at, Teal's work doing not just Palantir, but Anduril and doing like, you know, border robots, uh, you know, yeah. that they're, they're investing in a real project and that real project is American domination. By the and way, I want, um, I'm looking at the questions. Oh um, yeah. I probably already answered them. But, but this is um, related to what you were saying. Somebody says, I'm curious if the David Sachs, Peter Teal crowd has responded to or addressed your book and <laughs> um, any of what you lay out and any of it at all. Um, it's a long book. Uh, these people are notably not big fans of reading. 
of reading books in particular. Um, so I don't expect oh, yeah. that. Any... Some of them have openly said that, right? Yeah. Right. So like, I don't really think they're going to, if I, I'm like, I'm a communist, that. right? Like, exactly. yeah, it starts with, and the first page is like Karl Marx says. Yeah. Uh, so like, I don't know if that's how they're going to spend their time just to, I, I've had a couple of like Twitter VCs sort of bluff about reading it. And you uh-huh. like ask them a couple questions and it turns out happen. like <laughs> maybe their their definition of read means is a little different than like my definition of what it means to read a book. Yeah. Um, so no, I haven't heard any, anything directly from them, but if they were to engage with it, I think honestly um, they might be surprised. So like some of the conservative reviews of the book have actually been pretty strong um, in that they're like, yeah, he's a commie, but like there's some interesting history in here or whatever. And I think uh, especially some of the Palo Alto capitalists who, like, during this whole Silicon Valley bank collapse, were trying to explain what their politics were. And people were like, weren't you a libertarian? Why do you want the government to, like, rescue your bank? I think Sam Altman was like, if the name of the bank was something different, like uh, farming or whatever, it would be different. I'm like, aren't you the one who doesn't want government to regulate you? Also, farming about food, they give us food. Like, I want them to, I care about like that, that, you know, industry, like you're not making me food, right? Like, it's just so, and they couldn't even, they were whining, like for, they couldn't even wait two days, right? And I know, uh, they really, they really gave away the game. (laughs) Uh, but they could learn a lot about their own history in this book because, like, I don't – they don't know where their politics are. They know, like, individually in individual situations, yeah. like, where yeah. their interests are. Yeah. But they don't know what that political situated. ideology is and they don't know about Herbert Hoover and they don't know about, like, associationism and, like, what they're actually doing. Um, so they should read this book and find out. Like, there are some answers in them if they have to do it, like, uh, like – non-defensively uh another question is um it says um i'll take the questions for me too but i'm curious to hear your your thoughts here um it says that your book uh closes with uh a a proposal to give the land the land stanford sits back on back to its indigenous people um but despite being reasonable in the sense of being a logically sound argument you also seem to think it'll never happen (laughs) if the board of regents is left to its own devices I agree with you. Um, they 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 just started doing land land acknowledgments like now. Like I it wasn't happening when I was um, a student there at all. Um, even forget forget giving back land. And so so what does it take to make something like that happen? Well, it's interesting if if you actually go. I encourage whatever audience they get. I always encourage people to Google it. If you Google the Stanford land acknowledgement, excuse me, on that page. They have a, a like sentence disclaimer that says, we recognize that land acknowledgements are insufficient and we need to look to land back as a solution to these like historical oh, crimes or whatever. So, I know. And it's like, <laughs> but it's very funny because that line is saying like rhetoric is not enough. We must have stronger rhetoric <laughs> and it's like we you know have like little endowment of billions of dollars and we don't know what to do with that tens of billions of dollars thousands of acres including a number of like sacred and burial sites um and there's a and sometimes the reaction from people is like oh like what do you mean the indigenous people or like what are you talking about you can't just like oh so like do I have to leave or like what indigenous person, et cetera, et cetera. Like the Mwekmo Ohlone tribe, which the university acknowledges as the ancestral title holders of this land is a 614 person organization. Everyone has been genetically tested uh, compared they to remains. land tax too, right? That people can just pay. Uh, the Shuma is actually, a, that's actually a different Ohlone organization in the East okay. Bay. Um, and so it's hard because it's very like, um, the history is uh, somewhat disputed and there are, you know, oh, different organizations, different organizations have different, like, you know, versions of their ancestral territory or whatever. But Stanford acknowledges and the the evidence that I've seen and the work that I've done confirms um, the contemporary organization of the Moak Mo'olone tribe. And it's not, the Moak Mo'olone doesn't reject the nativeness of the people who are talking about the Shumi tax, whatever. They're just not part of, they're not an enrolled member of the tribe. And they are, my information is that they would be eligible if they chose to, but sometimes people just don't want to be part of the same organizations. And that works. That's true of tribes as with anything else. Hmm. Um, 
But that there is the 614 person tribe that's got stacks of anthropological evidence that has DNA testing. Um, uh, and that Stanford has acknowledged that Stanford has returned remains to this group because it acknowledges them, even though the federal government has refused to acknowledge their tribal existence, uh, Stanford does. And so like they have a partner with which they can communicate with which they can, you know, deal with which they can return land. Um, yeah. And so if they chose not to, it's not for lack of a partner on the other side. And it's not because like, and again, the, the history here is really shallow. And I go through it in the book. You can draw, there's only like five generations between the current chairman, Charlene. She's great. She's around. Like people can meet her, <laughs> you know, she's a real person, a real political leader. Um, between like five generations between her and uh, Leland Stanford. And we know where all those five generations are buried. We know their names, you know, and this is the territory. It's buried under Sand Hill Road, you know, buried under the venture capital firms. Uh, and so this sort of like throwing their hands up and being like, oh, indigenous, that must be like ancient history. Like there must be the colonization <laughs> who could, it's only as long, it's, it, it's in fact, exactly as long as the covenant with the Stanford's, right? It's yeah. exactly as long as this 8,000 acres of Leland Stanford university. So if that still exists, if those words still exist, if they're saying like, you can't sell this land still matters then why does their theft of the land not matter? Why does Leland Stanford's like signature on the documents uh, funding genocide not matter? Um, so at the same time, the, the question's right. It's like, why then this, this obviously should happen. It's very easy to make it happen. We hear like colleges make unaccountable left-wing decisions all the time, right? Like those crazy administrations colleges they're always trying to give land away i hear <laughs> this is what we hear from ron DeSantis, right it's like these are these are the hotbeds of uh mm. left-wing ideology etc they no one should have an easier time than stanford in you know exercising leadership here but instead what do we get we get the client the john door climate school brought to you by exxon or whatever you know like this is the that's the alternative in yeah. terms of seeing the future and i talk about in this book this moment where in the middle of bill shockley jr's uh narrative when he go you know in between being this megalomaniac uh nobel prize winner entrepreneur eugenicist soldier etc there's a point where he writes a, a suicide note and he says like i think i'm a bad person basically I, I have too much power and I'm a bad person and like, I can't trust myself to run the world. Like I don't trust myself to exist. Puts a gun in a revolver, spins the thing, puts it to his head and pulls the trigger, survives this game of like Russian roulette, puts the note in a box somewhere and goes on with his life and goes on to like ruin the world. Right. And so it's like, that's also at the core of Palo Alto is this sort of self-destructive. And you, you know, when these guys are at home late at night with themselves and they look in the mirror oh, and no. like, yeah. do they, do they really see the guy that they tell everyone that they are? Does Sam Altman look in the mirror at night and see uh, like a magician? I, I think he does. I really do think he maybe. Like saving the, I, I I think he does think he's saving the world. Like I, you know, and he surrounds himself with people who are telling him that he's saving the world, and then they all like have this echo chamber. And like, if you say something different, you're one person. So you're that crazy person they just block on Twitter, right? <laughs> As we're all we're all in that club here. Yeah, so, I think it, maybe ninety five percent of the time, but I, that five percent of the time, or you know, one percent of the time, I think there's that there's that. That kernel of doubt where they say, you know, what if none of this is real? What if I'm – and I think that's why I, I sort of set Teal apart from some of the other guys because I think Teal knows that the world exists and knows that history exists and, like, knows that things outside himself are real. And I think someone like Elon Musk probably thinks that the world is, like, literally a projection of his consciousness and might not, like, believe that anything else in the world exists – but like Peter Thiel knows that there is this American project that he is part of and that like yeah, he's he, working towards he's something very consciously like, yeah, participating in it. And so let me see. I'm going to take a couple of questions here. 
um, says, um, oh, your time even. several years on my high profile fi firing for blowing the whistle on racism. <laughs> again. Curious to hear my talk more about the future of ethical AI. Is such a thing even possible? What would it look like? And then there's the other question, should we believe that people like Elon Musk are actually concerned about the dangers of AI taking over society or whatever they're currently going on about, or is it just marketing for something they're trying to sell us? I'm going to start with that question. Um, no, we, sh we, we, we definitely should not believe them or any of the institutes that are funded by them trying to quote unquote warn us about AI um, existential risks. So like, you know, um, so the future of hum uh, future of life is I can't keep track of them. Future of humanity, future of life, whatever. Um, had um, this conference, I think it was in 2015. I wish I could show you the picture. It was all these white guys on stage, you know, including Elon Musk and like I think Ray Kurzweil was there and Matt, the, one of their founders was there and like all of these people, you know, talking about saving humanity from AI, right? And um, you know, Elon Musk funded them, um, funded, um, co-founded OpenAI, um, uh, uh, funded um, him and Peter Thiel funded DeepMind, and all of these. On with this hand, they're funding the organizations that say they're building artificial general intelligence, and then with this hand, they're funding the bozos like. Yudovsky <laughs> talking about existential risk and AI, and they're two sides of the same exact coin. Like basically. They think they want to, you know, they're building a god, and if they're building a god, they want to be the ones to do it and 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 control it. And if it's too powerful or whatever, um, you know, they want you to think about that, not what they are doing, right? So it's a marketing ploy, basically. Yeah. Oh my God, it's this too powerful thing that we've created. So, um, so in 2015, after this um, conference uh, that they had, so basically after Elon Musk um, and Peter Thiel invested in DeepMind, for instance, um, and it got bought by Google. They're like, oh my God, we can't control it anymore. And the Future of Life Institute came out with this letter, similar to what they're having right now, being like, oh my God, AI can be the devil and this and that. And then they um, co-founded OpenAI, like Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and Sam Altman and all these people. Because now it's a thing they can control, not Google, right? Now OpenAI is being controlled by uh, Microsoft, so <laughs> they can't uh, control it. And so they're like, like, oh my God, another pause letter, you know, mm -hmm. danger, whatever. Then Elon Musk the next day says he's doing like some, his own version of AI because, you know, OpenAI's version is going woke. So like, just do not pay attention to anything they were saying, which is very difficult to do because the entire media is on mm -hmm. them and we have to be distracted by all what we're uh, hearing from them. But it's, it's definitely a ploy. It's like a marketing ploy to distract us from them being the existential risks actually to humanity and what they're doing. Yeah. Lee Vincel, I think it's his term uses this term crit hype. And I think it's really great. It's like, it sounds like criticism, but is actually it's hype. Actually hype. Yeah. And I think that like, you know, that really nails the whole thing. Cause it's like, that's, that's just what it is. It's crit hype. Um, that's what they're doing. And they're um, really, like, and it gets very, it gets very like silly very quickly. I think where they're like, "Ooh, the spooky AI! Like, it would be a shame if it came to punish me and like reveal all my like, psychological or use a fucking jammer." I mean, like that's it's like it's so <laughs> silly, you know. And it's it is silly, but at the same time, it's like we have there. Are, people throughout the world who live in terror of like robots all the time who are flying yeah. over their houses and dropping bombs. And that's like, like yeah, yeah and, that, and that's not that. artificial general intelligence. That's just like a, a slightly more efficient bomb system uh, yeah. that like we've been dropping bombs on people for a hundred years and this is the latest but way to drop bombs on talk people. About, right? and, it, and it really pisses me off because I got fired for talking about issues and none of these dudes were on our side or whatever. Jeff Hinton was just doing his thing, you know. Meredith was pushed out for talking about military con uh, contracts. Mm -hmm. Then, no, that's not existential risk. So all of a sudden, these guys are talking about "quote unquote" humanity um, because maybe they see themselves also potentially being eliminated. <laughs> but whereas by AI or whatever it is, whereas like all the other stuff we were talking about, it's not them. 
right? It's all the brown people there, all the black people there, all the poor people there who are being um, impacted. Well, and now- they're selling the drones. They're selling the, you know, those drones have to get chipped somewhere. Those drones have need software contracts, for example. And, and I mean, you know, that's what Project money. Maven was about, right? Yeah. And so, so it's like people um, who are talking to us about existential risk right now, that's not what they, you know, that those are not the things they're thinking about when they say existential risk. So I think um, long story short is don't listen to them. But then I'm going to talk about the last the other question I have, which is um, what is my do I think about um is there what are, we'll talk more about the future of ethical AI? Um, mm. Is such a thing even possible? I think for me, you know, I think that technology, you know, I am an engineer and I am a scientist. So I got into this field because I got, I want to build stuff. I like building things and I like understanding things. Um, and I think that like, if, you know, we can build tools in service of the people we want to support, if that's the foundation with which we start, right? So for example, like one of our projects is on, um, you know, mapping out the the um, townships in South Africa because the South African government in, in its um, census just doesn't kind of acknowledge, like it's just the townships are lumped in with suburbs. It's as if mm-hmm. apartheid did not exist and people <laughs> had to go to townships. But people in townships know that their lives are not, you know, uh, the, the same as the people living in suburbs. And if you look at the neighborhoods, you'll know, right? So it's like all over the, you know, the world, like redlining in the U.S., you know, any any sort of apartheid state has that. And so what we're doing is we are using our expertise in machine learning, computer vision to map out where those are and then like actually do data analysis to see to provide people with proof so that they can go with tangible things and advocate for change. Um, So I do believe that, um, you know, you can build tools um, that um, it it depends on your mindset that helps certain groups of people. However, the entire um, foundation has to change for that, right? Like if you're going to do what I really don't like is like this whole AI for social good thing, because it to me, it seems like, you know, like you see with this book, um, we were, the whole thing is based on eugenics and the whole thing is based on dom- world domination and military. And so I, I liken it to like building a tank. Um, and so like, if you want to, you know, we, 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 our fund funding is about that and everything is about that. It's about building a tank. And then once we built the tank, we're trying to figure out, oh, can we do tanks for good? Can we do tanks for agriculture (laughs) instead? Can we, well, let's not build a tank, like let's build something else and we can build something else. There is nothing forcing us as humans to build the tank, right? Uh, Except for the power structures and the history and all of that. And so like, it's not like, you know, a law of physics that we have built to build tanks, right? It's like something else that we have to build. So I do think it's possible, but I do think it's really important to understand the ideologies that are driving us, which I think is what this book does, um, and and to have a different set of um, ideologies instead. And to question the idea of what intelligence is and the idea of general intelligence, because this is all from a eugenic framework. And if you look at the history critically, there is no such thing as intelligence that can be measured or created or like, or can be, you know, extracted from a body in a way that they think, you know, that intelligence yeah. is always embodied. There is no such thing as disembodied intelligence, you know, that we're familiar with. Instead, you have large language modules or you know you have you have like we should be specific about what we are talking about and what we're talking about yeah. is software uh built on the particular training data built to do particular things right and there's a danger in like reifying the algorithm or reifying artificial intelligence or ai so like i try to use the phrase ai as little as possible because yeah. it's not that's not what there's the only word in there i know what you're talking about is artificial which just means like yeah. a computer right it's like what yeah. do you mean by intelligence like do you mean knowing the answers to sports quiz questions because like that was the original iq test like and yeah. it might know those things you know like watson the on jeopardy or whatever could do good on an original iq test or yeah. even today's iq test but like does that what does that mean 
you have to like know the history of these tests or what they're for or whatever. It's like, it's to get yourself out off the front lines <laughs> that you don't get killed in the trenches of World War One, I, I guess, you know? Um, and so when you're like, it does become this uh, philosophical attempt to create something uh, that does not exist, that, they're, that they have to imagine exists. Um, so I don't believe in like, AI period, never mind like ethical AI or whatever. It's like, I can imagine that there would be, you know, if we figure out rudimentary fucking translation glasses that will allow us to speak to other people who don't speak the same language as us, this would be the signature accomplishment of like humanity as it exists. Like period, you know, this, that's the tower of Babel, right? That's the transcending our human condition. And it amazes me that this isn't what they're spending the entirety of all of our resources on. Well, right? it's like, uh, even that to me, it's not, I might not want you to understand what I'm saying. And I don't want you to just put on <laughs> glasses and understand, you know what I'm saying? I might, this is the thing, like when you, I, I think machine translation for me is a, a thing I, I, I work on and I think I like, but, you know, in, in certain conditions, right, under certain terms, like if it's especially if it's indigenous groups, they might not want you to learn their languages under their terms. And they might they might want to have, you know, some of their languages um, online accessible to their own people so that they can interact with the outside world. But they might not want you to understand. So it's like that there is this disrespect of of, you know, like what other people want. That's not like the. Do you hear my my dog? That's not like the dominant um, paradigm. So, hey, stop. Sorry. Yeah, one of the Sorry. that reminds me of just a, a couple of weeks ago at the Stanford powwow where the Muak Mo'olani, who have been recovering their language and recovering their dances and recovering, you know, their tribal records, um, and they're attempting to like perform these dances again in public. This was the second time they'd done it. You know since the thirties or whatever was this year. And they asked everybody in the audience, you know, put your cameras, please don't record this part. You know, you can re record the intro and then put your cameras down because we're not trying to have this part recorded. Someone, um, I was just at a workshop where someone said the right not to be online, right? We have the right to be online, but we also have the right not to be online. Like I come from a country where, you know, uh, the government regularly shuts down the internet and stuff. And I don't want them to be able to do that. But I also want, the ability to not be online if I don't want to. Yeah, and the the insertion of cameras into public spaces everywhere and constantly, and the um, and being recorded and tracked everywhere, like well, yeah. and that, to maybe to close it out because I think we're we're hitting time, but to talk about um, another Sam Altman project, right? Is the the to scan everyone's eyeballs in the world? World coin. World yeah. coin. Which, uh, <laughs> pretty amazing but the idea that like uh to collect everyone is this uh sort of existential human project um almost like pokemon right it's hard to imagine that it's not like pokemon inspired right like gotta catch them all with this little yeah. ball um but the idea that, that you should be able to like transcend uh the human condition, whatever human conditions exist through technology. The transhumanists, yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so core to these people's uh, identity and real understanding of the world at a like philosophical sort of religious level. Yeah. Um, that I don't think they're that they're really willing to grapple with, or maybe they're starting to now. There's like an esoteric turn in Silicon Valley that I'm reading about, right? <laughs> People are like becoming Catholics or something like that. Uh, yeah, so, I think that um, it, it definitely is a religious movement, and it's really interesting because it's by mostly people who just um, talk about how much they hate religion, right? And and like they're replicating, um, I think, all of the horrible things about large religious, um, powerful religious institutions, and leaving out any of the you know, good things that people find about religion, whether it's the spiritual, you know, I don't know, human connection or whatever it is, they're doing the complete opposite. I, I really do believe that their, their vision is to strip us from humanity altogether. Yeah. Upload your minds, live in the matrix, 
can talk to a chatbot your entire life. Don't, you know, like no artist, no human art, just like a quote unquote AI art or whatever. And it's just such a dystopian future. Like one that I really don't, that's not the future I want to live in. Yeah. They don't, they don't believe in God. They want to be God. Or uh, create it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is a, a scary position to be in, but it puts yeah. us in, in sort of a fun insurgent position, right? It's like, all right, well, <laughs> what happens to gods, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, right. I guess we're supposed to wrap up. Uh, we should wrap up. How do you want you to wrap for, it up? <laughs> thank you all for joining us at uh, at Haymarket Live. Um, follow us on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Look us up. We're around. Um, well, I'm looking forward to um, like really reading your book, and I'm I'm very excited for it. And um, I, I think this is a book I really should have had. I, I, I wish I had this book when I was an undergrad. Um, and even throughout my graduate school, you know, I think I'm do, doing a re-education of myself, like stripping myself away from the propaganda that's been, you know, I'm, I've been filled with. So I'm super excited to get to it. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for chatting with me. And thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. All right. I think we're... Uh...